All right, so with us, the, the program today will be uh, actually three, four segments. Uh, after the greeting that we get from our chairman, David Heller, and Michal will uh, start with a, a review, a basic review for about 15 minutes. Just tell us about where we are since October 7th till today, what's happening, and what are the current <coughs> feelings that we have. Then I will give a little brief about more uh, stories from the field and uh, what kind of amendments we've done to some of the programs, uh, where we stand today, also for about 10 uh, to 12 minutes. Then Yuval, the uh, director of our uh, international school, uh, will uh, speak mostly uh, telling us about uh, the alumni program that uh, we have. Uh, most likely Nurit will also be joining him for a few more comments as well. And uh, then we'll open it uh, for a discussion, uh, mo mostly touching on things that you might uh, be interested in touching on, things that we haven't touched on. That's pretty much our uh, schedule for today. Uh, more or less an hour and uh, 15 minutes, uh, not much than that. We see also Ursula that has joined us from uh, Switzerland in Geneva. Good to see you, good to have you. Donia also joined us from Germany. Uh, good to have you with us also. And uh, David, let's go. Thank you, Mohammed, and thank you uh, everyone for joining the call. I think uh, it's critically important that we hear from folks in Israel at this time and for us to get educated and understand. I also think that it's important if every anyone possibly can uh, jump on a plane and get to Israel and, and be a guest and uh, give support to Mohammed and Michal and the entire team. I think that's uh, critically important at this time as well. I had the opportunity to do that last week, and uh, it was really uh, eye-opening to be there and to uh, to be able to to share stories and to be face to face. So that's my opening and welcome, and I look forward to hearing from everyone. Thank you. Thank you, David. Michal, we're on ready for your updates. Sure. So hi, everyone. It's really good to see you. I thought that maybe the update should include two parts. So one part is to tell you a little bit about what's going on in Israel uh, in general, and then how it affects Giva Khaviva and our, pro our programs and what's happening, and also maybe Muhammad can, can add to our programming and the way uh, we do it right now. So first of all, I think the most crucial point of the last few weeks was last Saturday, um, the uh, Iranian, the night of the Iranian attack. I think that it's fair to say, and of course, David and, and James were here in Israel, maybe um, other people too. Um, I think it's fair to say that it was alarming and scary. Okay, I think people managed to deal with it. Um, and of course, the fact that nothing really happened at the end to, to civilians, um, <clears throat> except except of uh, one child in the South that was injured and she's now getting better, fortunately. Um, I think that still we never experienced in Israel such a Hollywood-like attack, right? The fact that we were noticed in advance and it was all in the news, like it was broadcast. And we saw the missile coming uh, on their way to Israel. Uh, it was a bit like living in a movie. I'm sure, I'm sure you heard it. Um, and I think that from the perspective of Givat Khamiva, first of all, all of us had to take care of our families, right? We had to make sure that we have a, space, uh, a safe space. Um, a lot of us, or many of us, didn't really sleep at night, not just because we were nervous, but also because it was very loud. So if you lived anywhere near uh, um, an, IDF, uh, air, um, uh, an IDF base, you hear the missiles, right? And you hear the... Um, what's going on. So you can't really sleep. So a lot of, of pe people from our team um, couldn't really work uh, on Sunday. Um, and also at the same time, we also had a few dozens of students in our in Yivat Chayiva on campus from the international school. Also, we also had to take care of them also to communicate everything that was happening to their parents. So they spent the night in a, in a bomb shelter uh, just to be on the safe side. And I think it was a um, a very clever decision made by Yuval and Rit, also because Givat is really close to an IDF base where they 
uh, they use it for the what we call the chet, right? The, the missile that actually um, was used a lot during this attack. Um, so I think that was that was the night where Israel is really felt for the first time all over the country that first of all we have to trust the IDF right now to protect us, and second of all that there is nowhere to run, right? Like the first thing that they did is to close the airport for Israelis. That's very scary because it's the only way to get out. Um, and then when they closed the airport, it was, you know, everyone here knew that we're stuck here, whatever happens. And I can tell you as a young mom that it's not the nicest thing to experience with young kids. Um, so I think that um, many Israelis at that night felt really helpless on one hand. The other hand, when we woke up in the morning or just, you know, if we didn't sleep the, the, when the morning came, um, I think everyone were really, really relieved that things are still functioning. And also that the international community uh, understand the situation of Israel and the situation of this war, uh, which is not only between the Palestinians or Hamas and Israel, but it's something a bit bigger, larger, and more complicated than that. Uh, and maybe we are all Israelis and Palestinians, just, you know, tools in a game that is not really controlled by us. Um, I think that was the discourse, the main discourse uh, in Israel. The second thing that happened after that is that for the first time since October 7th for sure, but also since this government was formed, the coalition started to show some signs of uh, instability uh, because of uh, a specific bill regarding um, the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox, and, uh, and the way or the deal they're supposed to have um, concerning uh, drafting to the, to, the, to the IDF. So, for the first time, we see it's not really stable, and we and we start to see um, certain political actors doing like certain moves and saying things about the next election and stuff that we didn't hear until now. I think it's also fueling the protests, right? So now we're seeing really big protests uh, in uh, or large protests in Tel Aviv and in other parts of Israel every Saturday night. Maybe you remember it from before of the war, before uh, October seventh. And also, in a weird way, it's also fueling uh, the police, which is controlled now by Itamar Ben-Gvir, um, the, the minister of, of national security, uh, who totally took control of the police. So now we're seeing a very violent police um, treating the protests in a very severe way that we didn't see before. Um, and it's out in the open, right? So if before that we had certain... Um, police officers that talked against uh, the minister, against the ministry, and also talked about, you know, the right to protest and, and how they should, um, you know, allow it to happen. Now we don't really hear it, um, and the police is really, really, really harsh and difficult. The opposite is happening when you look at the Arab society in Israel, and although we saw after, after October 7th, we saw kind of like um, a pause. In the, in the acts of violence and crime within the Arab society. But I think, and Muhammad, maybe, I don't know if Muhammad will correct me, but I think that in the last four to eight weeks, the level of violence and crime is something that we never saw before. So like every day you have like four, five, six people getting murdered uh, and killed in, in, the, in the Arab society. And because the general levels of violence and death and, and suffering in our region is so high, it's not even news, right? So you can hear it in like the four, fifth, sixth, eighth story on the news. It will never get to national TV uh, news. Um, you can only read about it and no one is really thinking about it because suddenly after the seventh, eight people who got murdered is not a large number anymore or 10. Or 15, uh, which is horrible because the, the police is not even, you know, treating or trying to get the people responsible for that. Um, 
And I think that in the in a way, the Arab community kind of gave up. Like they don't even expecting this government or the police to do something about it. And it's getting really risky. And actually this week, there was a report saying that for an Arab citizen in Israel, there are, he's more likely to be killed in like in 8%, like 8% more likely to be killed than, an, than a Jewish citizen, which is crazy. Eight, eight crazy times enough. more. No, eight, eight times more. Ah, eight times more, sorry, eight times more than a, than, a, than a Jewish citizen, which is crazy. And these are the numbers for 2021, no, 2022. So before this government came into power. So I think that the next report for 23, the end of 22 and 23, is going to be a horrible report because we know the numbers are worse and we know the situation is, is, is getting um, even worse every day. Um, so. I think that's something that we're going to confront in a certain point in time. Uh, but for now, it's just a huge problem that nobody is paying attention to. Um, and it is also something that, in my opinion, although they will never admit it, also something that makes this government even weaker, right? Because still we're talking about 20% of the population, population which, is, which are really, really scared to even walk in the streets or send their kids to school. Um, and they are electoral power. Um, and I think someone is going to, to use it, to use this electoral power. Um, I think the third point is the fact that Ramadan passed um, and Passover is almost done. I think we're halfway through it. Um, and it was really, really quiet. And a lot of people uh, worried that we're going to see, you know, levels of violence between Jews and, and Arabs in Israel that we never saw before and we never witnessed before. But nothing happened. Nothing happened on the on, in the Laksa Mosque in Jerusalem. Nothing happened in the mixed cities. Um, and I think it was be because of two reasons. One is local leaders that understood that they, again, I, I, I think I, I said it many times before, but I think that local leaders and local uh, politicians understood that they that they shouldn't give this little present to the uh, to the extremists on both sides. Um, and the second reason is because at the end Netanyahu stopped um, what was the biggest mistake he could have done, which is to close Al Aqsa Mosque. Uh, to uh, to um, Arab citizens of Israel and citizens of East Jerusalem. Uh, the fact that he didn't do it, the fact that the police and the Shin Bet actually um, convinced him not to do it uh, was an important step, and it really, really weakened his coalition. So in that sense, I have to tell you that I think he was scared enough to do something that was against his political interests. And that's very interesting because we don't see that a lot. I don't have a, an explanation why he did it, except of the fact that I know that the Shin Bet, the military, the police, everyone told him that that's something that they could not deal with. So he better stop it, even if it's going to mess up his coalition. Um, and luckily, he agreed. That was, a, that was huge for all of us. Um, I think that if we're trying to understand how it affects the Givat Chaviva program, all of this, all this situation, is that for now, in a way, everyone is waiting for the big next thing, right? We don't know if it's going to be in Gaza. We don't know if it's going to be in the north. We don't know if it's going to be, we all hope it's going to be, but we don't know if it's going to be a hostages deal, right? Is fire and hostages deal. But something is going to happen, and I think we're all patiently waiting. Um, all of our programs are running while people are waiting. So I think that this pause is really, like everyone, everyone are really, really nervous, but still they understand that we need to keep going and we need to keep calm within Israel and we need to keep good relations. We didn't have any school canceling on us for any of our programs. And we saw something really interesting. We've opened up to new program, two pilot program uh, for young adults, right? So not students, not, not like kids and students in school, 
but let's say graduates like fresh graduates from from university so people between the ages of like 25 to 33 right and we, we we've opened up through two groups one for Jew, jews and arabs in like good positions um so like journalists and young politicians and young um civil society leaders and one only uh for um younger people just graduating from from university um and one of these groups in one of these groups we had like 15 places right uh it's a it's a shared program with the federation of new york and we got 85 cvs and resumes of people that really wanted to get in and good people influential people um and we were we were really really surprised we can only choose 15 uh but it gave us a notion of of how much people want to you know grab this opportunity for hope within israel because most of the people feel that they have nothing to do with the israeli palestinian conflict right or with the conflict with gaza or even with the west, west bank right now but they do feel that there's something to be done within israel and i think as always like muhammad always uh, say it is kind of like a bridge to get you to try to understand the different narrative to try to maybe think about ways or any sign of hope that you can think of in the in the larger conflict um and what we got from that from you know getting so many resumes and people wanting to be part of our program um is that we need more groups and we need more of these kind of programs for people that are not students they are not part of any school or any university uh but they want to be part of a shared arab and jewish uh groups and to be part of this process of understanding the other and trying to imagine a more democratic and equal Israel. Um, for me, it was, it was um, a very good experience to see that we do have partners in, in, you know, in our society, not in civil, civil society organizations and not with like people that are already engaged or you know, educators, et cetera, but people from you know, all groups of society doing all kinds of things really wanted to be part of it. Um, and another thing that we noticed is that many universities are now calling upon Givat Chaviva to try to just calling for help. And it can be, and they want us to assist them in, in all kinds of different projects. So for instance, in the University of Haifa, they asked us to uh, be part uh, of a conference about um, Hebrew skills for, for students. They discovered that a lot of students from the Arab community um, is dropping out of school because they don't have uh, sufficient um, language skills. So we're going to work on that because we know how to teach spoken Hebrew. It's one of our programs and we're, tr and, and we're trying to help them with that. In Atania College, I think I already told you about it, um, they asked us to work with the administration and with the faculty about how to communicate with Jewish and Arab students, how to you know, control a class when you have Arab students and Jewish, Jewish students who just came back from the reserve and from you know, the battlefield. Um, so we're doing that. We're trying to assist everyone in the best way we can. Um, and we feel that we are really, really needed. So a lot of schools, universities, municipalities um, are approaching us to ask us how they can make their life better, how they can make their students' life better, um, how they can make the city life better, how they can communicate with different, you know, mayors and politicians from, you know, Jews and Arabs. Um, and this, you know, time of waiting and anticipating the unknown, which is the way we live our life right now. We're just at in, 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 <laughs> sorry, we're just waiting for something that we don't know exactly what it is to happen, right? And we're trying to, you know, to control ourselves and we're trying to protect our kids and we're trying to protect our programs and we're trying to protect our students, but we're not, we don't really know what is coming. Um, so I'm really happy to report you that just like James said at the beginning, I don't know if you heard it, I am really proud of like the demo democratic leaning um, society within Israel, which is trying to hold on to the positive things that we still have here while we're waiting for the unknown. Um, and I'm really proud that Givat Chaviva is there to assist them with that. Um, and that's it for now.
Okay, thank you, Michal. Uh, I will add a few more comments uh, before I turn it to Yuval and Nurit. <coughs> you know, we give out Habiba in normal times. It's, you know, usually we, we the, the main business for us is peace education. And uh, with time, we uh, focused more and more on internal issues between Jewish and Arab citizens. Uh, during the war, uh, the major phenomena that develops, usually it comes and uh, develops for two, three weeks and then disappears. And sometimes the impact of such a crisis lasts for maybe a decade. Uh, sometimes we feel the impact of big incident of clashes uh, or tension that might last for a, a, almost a decade. And we need to do a lot of fixing, a lot of damage control after the crisis. Uh, but with time, we learned that it's important to get involved during the crisis, one, to do some kind of damage control, to reduce the damage that the tension, the reality around us can do to Jewish-Arab relations. I'll give you one very worrying uh, uh, number, something that if, if you've seen the data from our, uh, sorry, I'm not with video, if you've seen our data, from our conference on the 9th of uh, January with the, under the auspices of uh, President Rivlin, we measured two components, uh, the level of fear, mutual fear of Jewish citizens uh, fearing Arab citizens, uh, and the level of mistrust. And you could see that the fear and mistrust of Jews towards Arabs, uh, Arab citizens mainly, uh, was somewhere around 40% before October 7th. Today, it's around 80%. Among Arab citizens, it was around 24%. Today, it's about 52%. Basically, our subject matter, our problem has doubled. The, the reality that we work with, uh, the problems that we're trying to attend to, uh, their quantity doubled in our face. Uh, in the process, we need to figure out new techniques. Uh, one to do quick fixes, not just to you know because the education usually takes a lot of time to kick in. You need five, ten, maybe a decade to see social change as a result of education. So now we are faced with the challenge of to, of doing quick fixes in our intervention uh, programs but also to prevent uh, increased damage. So we know that if we bring new groups today uh, of Jewish and Arab youth, youth that have never met before, their immediate tendency is to go into the narrative debate. Their immediate tendency is to go into, you know, nicely we call it dialogue, but the dialogue in those circumstances in tense times becomes a debate. And it's a debate that very quickly results into a, a very loud and very high a, a, a level. And the maximum you can get out of it is agree to disagree, but we can you can also do a great deal of damage. So as a principle, we do not bring new groups of Jewish and Arab youth for first time meeting uh, during the crisis period. What we do, we focus a great deal on what we call uninational work, work as separate national group before we bring them in binational encounters. We spend a lot of time on uninational uh, structure, preparing them for such an encounter. And when we feel that two groups are ready for an encounter, then we come in and we invite them for an encounter. Uh, not surprisingly, we were expecting it to happen. Uh, but we see that all of the groups that worked before, all of the binational groups that worked before October 7th, and many, we have most of our programs are multi-year programs, but all of the programs that we had and had a binational component before October 7th are back in place. New programs, we are hesitating to bring new encounters, uh, or we're uh, hesitating to bring in, but we did have the courage and the methodology to bring in all the dialogue groups, all of the uh, uh, classes that uh, we used to meet once a month, all of the youth leaders that used to meet once a month, all of the teachers that used to meet once a month, the mayors, the business forum, the women groups, 
all of those groups are back in place. Uh, so, which tells you that our past intervention gives us organizational health to kick in in the right strategy during the time of crisis. That time of crisis, although it challenges new territories to be built or new pro programs to be uh, ignited, but all of our older programs that were started before for encounters, they're all back in place. And that's a, a, a very a real uh, a testimony. Michal also said that we, we are now moving into another level, which is more of leadership uh, training. Uh, the fellows program that we uh, recruit, just finished recruitment for. Uh, we also have uh, 50, 16 people. We had 130 applicants recruiting them in the hardest time. It, it tells you that you know the field is still healthy and uh, that uh, uh, there are many people that are coming with uh, uh, energy and capacity and they want this to be uh, put in the, in the right time. I remind us, after October uh, 2000 events, uh, the whole field of Jewish Arab relations, we used to call it coexistence then, not shared society, went into pretty much a meltdown. More than 90%, Ken Bandler was researching that and he's with us here. Uh, almost 90% of the organizations that existed uh, in October 2000 melted within a year. And this is exactly what we're trying to prevent because we want to maintain the capacity of the organizations active in this field and us as the organization doing almost 70% of the work. We have a duty one to survive as an organization, but also we have a duty to survive a, a, as sort of a leading a institution that can show the path of how this work needs to be done during crisis time. We managed to pull together the artists in residency program also during the, the most tense period. A, we invite six Arab and six Jewish young artists who graduated from, high, from university and they come and they spend three months at Givat Khaliva for a three month residency program where they work together, they sleep in the same dormitories, eat from the same plates. We're trying to create more and more interdependency between Jewish and Arab artists to imitate the success story in the uh, medical industry, where we see wonderful success in Jewish Arab relations between Jewish and Arab medical staff, who are also maintaining fantastic island of success in the medical industry. Meanwhile, we're not just celebrating the medical industry, we're creating new islands. We're not just celebrating the obvious, where interdependency is clear. We are creating new interdependency islands and the artists in residency for the second year in a row, we managed to pull it together at a period where everyone was afraid that this, this program is going to collapse. Another project that many of you have contributed to is the Hebrew language training program. We called it a, a, a shared language, where we place a Jewish teachers in Arab schools to improve the quality of a Hebrew among uh, Arab middle school students. We operate in almost 50% of the uh, Arab schools in Israel. We have about 60, 70 teachers. Out of them, you know, we were afraid that this program is going to go through meltdown also, that uh, many of the teachers will be afraid of going to teach in Arab towns. And actually we started hearing a lot of uh, hesitance and resistance about this, but we got involved in time. We got involved in time in working with the teachers. We got involved in time in working with the principals. Sometimes we had to talk to the mayors to do what we call de-escalation and damage control. And out of the 70, only one dropped out because of the political tension. But 69 are back in business. 96, 97 percent of this project is still operating. In the high tech uh, uh, seeds program, a program in which we not, we cooperate with Natanya College to uh, uh, put Arab students in uh, high, uh, Arab, uh, middle school students to start studying uh, academic courses in computer science. By the time they finish high school, uh, they finish 50% of their undergraduate degree. The first escalation of Jewish Arab relations was at Natanya College, was at the, at the dormitories. We were at the peak of the registration period and we started witnessing very severe pullout of Arab students that didn't want to go to study and at this college. Their parents were calling us saying, we are afraid of sending our kids to study at this college. 
and to partner with this college. And uh, they started asking for money back and anyone that asked for money back, we either gave it immediately if they really asked quickly, uh, or we asked them to delay their decision by a couple of weeks. Usually we recruit 130, 100 new students for this program. This year, we have 138 students that started the program, 38% increase. Now, ask me why, I can tell you only the result of our intervention. We got involved, we were at Netanya College, we pulled the conference, we had the president of the college, we had the police commander of the, of the city, we had the mayor's office involved. We managed to repack the tension that was created at Netanya College at the beginning of the war with a story of managed situation. We, we showed that that situation got managed and we got the right messaging coming out from the leadership of the university that came and uh, uh, put itself on the line to say this is not the culture of the university that we need to maintain. So damage control did help us. Uh, we man within the second or third week, we pulled together all of the teachers programs uh, and and we pulled them to we put them into action. All of them are operating at full uh, capacity. And uh, the last thing I want to uh, touch on is that uh, you know conflict uh, also creates opportunities. Uh, so for us as an organization, there are lots of opportunities that we took on ourselves where we couldn't say uh, no. And one opportunity was to be part of the national effort to take care of the evacuees. We housed uh, 300 evacuees for a period of three months on our campus. Uh, many of them came back to plant trees uh, at our campus uh, on, on February. Uh, they felt very much uh, connected with the organization and they came to engage also emotionally and engage with the, uh, with the people that took care of them. Uh, we are involved very much with Jewish and Arab mayors to maintain good neighborly relations between the neighboring towns. Uh, you know, we, Michal, touched on the uh, problem of political leadership that we have from this government, which is a, a government that I would say represents in its discourse the antithesis for a shared society. So we need to seek alternative voices that promote shared society. Uh, the conference we held in January in which we had President Rivlin and, and uh, uh, Benny Gantz and the Minister of Interior from Shas was very significant and it positioned us as an organization as the one that is capable to bring in alternative leadership that can speak in favor of shared society. But we're not satisfied just on the national level. We're now going to the municipal level and to community leaders asking them to also uh, uh, put their name uh, in support of shared society. Uh, overall, I would say that uh, uh, our work has maybe not doubled, but definitely increased over the last uh, uh, seven months. Uh, we expect even more increase. As I said, our, prob our subject matter, our problem has doubled. So uh, in preparation for the next school year, for this coming September, our needs, uh, whether uh, it is organizational needs, meaning we need to train more facilitators. We need to train more teachers. We need to raise more money to double our capacity to engage in order to deal with double of the problem. So I'll stop here. I see that some people started posting questions. We'll deal with the questions after Yuval and Norit give us their intervention. Yuval? Hi, thanks, Muhammad. Hi, everyone. Uh, introduce yourself because many do not know you yet. So uh, my name is Yuval Dvir. I'm uh, the head of uh, United Givat Chaviva International High School. And uh, with me is uh, Norit, Managing Director of United Givat Chaviva International High School. And uh, we wanted to share an update on a new project of ours with the title of a talk about hope in conflicts. Uh, so this will be only a, a brief presentation, uh, and, and we are happy to uh, further discuss this if you are interested at a later stage. Uh, just to frame the, the reasons for such a project, uh, when uh, October 7th uh, happened, 
Uh, obviously, our priority was the safety and uh, security of our students. And uh, we felt um, compelled to make sure that everybody is okay, everybody's well being is taken care of. Uh, and, and we acted very, uh, very carefully and uh, very quickly. Uh, I, I think in a way which was effective to the extent that we, we had almost all students back on campus after a while, after some of them left because of the beginning of the war. Uh, so I think that students really felt that uh, Givat Khabiba is taking care of them uh, in, in, a, in a profound manner. So after the initial shock, one of the things that we uh, started talking about was what would be the educational message? What would be the educational narrative? What is our uh, message and voice here? And it was very clear for us from the beginning that uh, we need to talk about hope. Uh, it was abstract then, and it was very, um, it, it was the, the discussion uh, took place in a, a, a time of so much uncertainty and so much fears that it was, it was really the beginning. Uh, but what we started the discussion, we started it within the team and then we started to do it with the students and, and we started thinking about how to define hope and what are the displays of hope and why are we doing something that it relates to hope. And, and it, it became very interesting and we saw that it interests students as well. And at a specific point, we started a connection with um, uh, a scholar in the Hebrew University uh, whose name is Dr. Odede Domileshem. And he's a, a political psychologist uh, specializing in hope in conflicts. This is his uh, field. And uh, particularly uh, in regards to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And, and I want to share just briefly two things about Oded's very extensive and very interesting work. One of them is the model of hope, which he calls optimal hope in conflicts. And what Oded uh, presents is a, a construct of two components, which means that hope is built out of a wish and an expectation. And in the context of a, of a conflict like ours, the wish for peace represents what people may think about it. And the expectation that it happens is the second part. And if you have both, then you have optimal, optimal hope in conflict. And the, and, and, and the second thing I want to share with you is that in a very recent survey done in 2022, in a representative sample, both in Israeli society and in Palestinian society in the West Bank and Gaza, what Oded found was that more than 70% of each of the peoples wish for peace, but less than 10% in each of the peoples expect that peace will happen. So there is a huge gap in between the wish and the expectation. And, and this was, uh, for us, a very interesting uh, leeway to enter a more a deeper level of, of the project. And we felt that maybe our voice, our message as a school that brings Israeli, Jewish, and our Palestinian students together with international students, maybe what we can do is to work with the model and demonstrate how expectation could actually increase. And why is education an important tool in increasing expectation that this is possible? And what we've decided to do then was to approach our graduates, the people who uh, took the decision to go through this journey of um, shared living and learning in Givat Chaviva for two or three years. All of them are very young because the school is young, but we already have something like 200 graduates and we've approached 12 of them as, a, as an initial uh, trial. And they immediately said, yes, we want to hear more. We want to think about it. And very quickly, we found ourselves actually working with teams of graduates. And, and, and we decided that we'll build team of, of pre-graduates that have representation of an Israeli Jew and our Palestinian and international graduate. And what we'll do is to generate an intellectual talk about hope and conflict based on their life experience. And we thought that the audiences that could benefit most from that would be a high school students both in Israel, but also in other countries. Now, when we started this process, several things happened which were very much um, important for us. One of them was the rise of the far-right coalition in the Netherlands uh, in November 
uh, and, and, and we started uh, reading about Islamophobia and uh, the way Muslims are being uh, seen by the coalition there. And we started reading more about what's happening in Germany. And, you know, just in the very few, the last few days, we see what's happening in Columbia University in New York. And, and we understand that the voices of shared society, the voices of uh, multiculturalism, the voices of understanding each other through dialogue are very much far away from, from these realities. And, and throughout this journey, what we've done, and it's about, I think, three or four months that we've been discussing this and then starting to work. And obviously, then we have a lot on our plates. We have an academic program to run, and the situation in Israel requires us to be very attentive to students needed every single moment. So this was like a very partial line of what we did, but we reached a point where we have the projects rationale, we have the framing, we have the graduates team, we have, uh, we have simulations, and we've also created a pack uh, for school principals and community leaders who will be interested in bringing this uh, talk to their uh, communities on what this talk is about. And I want to and I want to share and, and and this is where also Nurit will obviously um, uh, expand. This talk is not about the politics of the war. It's not about the war, and it's not about who's right and who's wrong. It's about the opportunity to think about uh, living together, about peace, and about hope in a very different way, which is tangible and it's doable and it's happening. It's happening right now in very, very few places, I think in the world and probably in Israel, we are uh, the leading organization in that, but it's an important voice. And, and, and this is where we also wanted to share this information together with you this evening with the hopes that you are uh, interested in commenting and thinking about it. And also maybe you feel that you have the connections to uh, communities and schools that might be interested in that. Um, and here I want to ask Nuri to expand a little bit more. Thank you, Yvette. So um, I don't. I know our time is short, so I don't really want to expand more. I, I'll just say that um, from my experience of going around mainly the United States, we feel that there is a lot of openness to hear now the voice of coming from Israel that is not what you hear in the news and not what you um uh, hear about the army and politics but the people i think that a lot of people want to hear people and that's in the, another uh part of the voice of people one thing we really hope for is uh, naturally at this time one of our um i would say challenges is to bring international students to israel i think each one of you as a parent could understand that it's not an easy time for from anywhere in the world to choose to send the young students to Israel. So we hope that these graduates, when they will go around and speak about the program, will build the confidence with candidates and their families um, to say the advantage of going through a program and opening the vision of the mind for these young people is greater than maybe the risk of going to Israel now. So we know um, it will take time and it's slow, but um, as Yuval said, the, the positive response we got from our graduates means, like Mohammed said, that we see that there is urge and there is um, interest in sharing the opportunity of shared society. Okay, so we open now for not just a Q&A, but also for a discussion. Uh, anyone that wants to share a thought, it doesn't have to be a question, it can be just a thought. And if a question emerges out of that thought, uh, then we can also discuss it between us uh without you know you know that we can talk forever uh, i i just came back from uh, brussels last week and i spoke at the european parliament uh, they had a small conference on uh, uh, civil society or civil society peace organizations 
and uh, it was uh, three people from Israel, two Palestinians uh, from the West Bank that uh, were there, and uh, we had a lot of European Parliament members, mostly from uh, Spain, Brussels, uh, Denmark, Norway, and uh, Germany that uh, attended. Uh, so there's a lot of interest in this. Uh, just commenting also on one more thing that Michal said about uh, the situation that we faced uh, on that Saturday night with the Iranian missiles. Uh, some of you already heard me speak about this. It's uh, it's very challenging for us on the personal level, you know, to work uh, and keep uh, not just the faith, but keep the energies uh, to work in this field. Uh, we need to reinvent ourselves pretty much every single day. Uh, Friday night, Friday the 12th of April, uh, I had a very happy celebration. It was the third day of uh, Eid al-Fitr, which is the three days that follow, celebration that follow the month of Ramadan. And on Friday night, I uh, I had my daughter got engaged. So she, she finally, that's a second daughter. And uh, it was a very, you know, we made an engagement party, but we decided not to have music, not to have a meal, just to invite a few friends and a very a, a small event but still, it brought us a lot of happiness. Uh, 24 hours later, I was fixing a mattress for that same daughter uh, at the bomb shelter because uh, missiles were running above our home. We had three missiles that we saw in our eyes. And uh, as Michal said also, our house, our town, Excel, some of you have visited me here, is very close to near David, which is one of the biggest Air Force bases uh, from where a lot of the uh, fighter jets were going to try to inter you know, intercept the, uh, the Iranian uh, missiles and uh, uh, air aircrafts uh, that uh, they were sending. And we're not just conscious about this, about our own family and about ourselves, but we're conscious about this also about uh, our organizational capacity about our own staff, uh, which means that we need to spend the time and energy uh, with the staff to keep them in, in, intact, to keep their uh, mind focused, uh, one on the mission, uh, but at the same time uh, to know that they're fit, they're fit for duty, and uh, those challenges that uh, face us uh sometimes uh, challenge our fitness uh, speaking also about what you've already shared with you about uh, uh, the program with uh, our graduates uh, we are in the process of uh, and maybe steve riskin can help us in this somehow uh, we are in the process steve i caught you when you just went out of <laughs> you closed the, <laughs> the camera but you're back uh, we are in the process of regathering our capacity as an organization in uh, bringing and putting together alumni list uh, and to put together maybe an alum, alumni club. You know, over the years, Givat Habiba, you know, if we if we train about 10,000 people a year, and the Jewish Arab Center for Peace has been in place for 61 years, founded in 1963. So if we do the numbers, it's about half a million people that have come through us, 600,000 to half a million. If half of them are alive, that's 300,000. If 10% want to be involved, that's 30,000. Uh, in the past, you know, one, one problem that prevents us from working, gathering data is that most of the kids that we work with are under age, below the age of 18. So we're, allowed, we're not allowed to keep their data uh, during time of participation. Uh, so now we're running a, a data collection and within less than a month, we have more than 800 people uh, that we've managed to gather their current uh, contact information. Uh, but we hope within the next uh, couple of years to turn this 800 to maybe 10,000. And this will be the largest uh, Givat Haviva uh, uh, community that we can also rely on, not just by sending them emails and inviting them to 
uh, participate in, in, in uh, events, uh, but also to try to activate them uh, to a second level of engagement of the work of Givat Khabib. That all of that was trying to trigger you to ask a question or make a comment. Okay, who's who's the bravest person here? All right, Mark Alain. From... I, I can I can answer Mark Alain because he wrote a question about shared language. Mark, you want to ask it in in person? Uh, yes. Uh, when when you spoke about the teachers being back to their schools, this uh, reminded me that I was surprised when I read uh, Michal's editorial mm -hmm. that she used the uh, the feminine form, uh, talking about the teachers being back to the schools. So uh, why was that? Was uh, was there a, a, a notable difference between? No, in uh, Hebrew, as you know, in Hebrew. So I, I'm not sure how it how it um, translated into English, but in Hebrew, you just need to choose a form, feminine or masculine. And because most of the teachers, the vast majority of teachers in Israel are women, I just oh. used the feminine form. So all of the teachers came back in, except one, men and women, but like 99% of them are women. Okay, so uh, this means that your choice was to use the feminine form, um because you do have a choice yeah in hebrew you have a choice you, you have to, like there is no form okay. that is not feminine or as, yeah. as a father to three daughters and one son i say that's a good choice <laughs> thank you thank you other comments ideas Steve. I just wanted to say, I think it's interesting you should talk about an alumni club. The Institute, USIP, is thinking through how it can expand its alumni, so to speak, grantees, fellows, staff. We've been we've thought about it off and on for years. It's a labor intensive kind of thing, but I think it's a great idea. It's, you know, uh, there's lots to think about of the kind of engagement you want communications linking <laughs> events it's it's labor intensive but and it'll take a while i think to build something but i think it's a great idea as far as grants with usip we're done for the year but we can talk more about um as this gets rolling you can read my mind that i want to apply to usip for a grant for that <laughs> no that's a, just wonder, okay. that's a wonderful skill <laughs> But yes, I mean, meanwhile, we're trying to do it without uh, a, a, any funding that we got just to gather our and assess our capacity. Right. And as I said, within a month, we get, we have 800 uh, people and uh, we're, we're making you know basic contact with them just to see how many really want to be involved and to create a nucleus group like that. Uh, social media has been very helpful. Technology is very helpful. It makes it much, much easier than uh, what we would have thought about it 10 years ago. 10 years ago, you know, you would need a lot of, you know, ear to mouth and uh, mouth to ear. Uh, but today, technology has been very helpful. Our uh, uh, digital footprint actually uh, has increased dramatically uh, over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, that was one of Michal's major projects when she came in, our digital footprint meaning the amount of people we reach every year was about uh, uh, half a million people. Today, we reach about three and a half million people every year. Uh, that's seven times more our capacity uh, in, in using the, uh, in the, the internet in interacting with people. Uh, and we feel that you know, using fresh new technologies in this work will allow us to go faster than what we would have been able to do it a few years ago. Larry, you uh, raised your hand. Um, yeah, just a quick comment. As someone who has uh, been an evaluator of programs and the like, and I think I mentioned this to both Michal and Nurit, I, I can't say how much it is, uh, how important it is to be able to show the lasting impact of, of the programs. And an alumni association to me is the sort of 
low hanging fruit in this regard. I mean, it, it is, as Steve said, labor intensive, but it is, you know, probably the most dramatic thing that you can show five years, 10 years out from a program, what impact the program has had on uh, the participants. And so I certainly encourage uh, the investment in that. And, uh, you know, I think there'll be some researchers even who will be interested in working with you in terms of devising a program, both on the, uh, you know, general programs, but particularly on the high school uh, alumni uh, that will be very uh, mutually impact impactful. Excellent, thank you. Mark, I see your hand. Yes, uh, this is actually uh, an idea that we had raised uh, a few years ago and we asked again and again, and uh, I'm very happy that finally it, it, uh, it it's coming, takes place, and I'll be glad to introduce to our board the idea of a new uh, line of funding for this. Okay, so uh, Eden is with us on the call. She will send you the materials that we've gathered on this already. Wonderful, thank you. We have already some data that we put together on, on this. All right, so do we call it a night on our end? It's still, you know, not too late for you, but uh, the last thing I will give you, you know, a, a piece of information. I'll be spending a semester in the United States uh, uh, from uh, mid uh, mid August until mid December. Uh, I'll be teaching at uh, the University of Illinois uh, in Champaign Urbana, uh, basically one day a week, which means the rest of the six days a week, I can see many of you here. Uh, Gail, yes, I will be not in Chicago, in Champaign-Urbana. It's three hours away, but it means we can uh, meet so we can start putting uh, arrangements and uh, making coordinations for possibly having coffee together or maybe doing events, you know, parallel events in, home, in homes, communities uh, where we can not just meet like this uh, virtually, but we can also meet uh, physically. All right, thank you very much. And there will be a recording that uh, Sadie will share with you. Lloyd, you raised your hand, you want to say something or just a goodbye? Wonderful. Thank you very much and have, goodbye. Thank there you, will everyone. be a video recording if